Heart Drops of Dharmakaya, the Dzogchen Practice of the Bon Tradition, by Shard Satoshi Gelson, commentary by Lopon Tenzin Namdak. Preface. The publication of this text is a first for two reasons. It is the first time a text from the Bonpo tradition has been published in its entirety, demonstrating the vitality and importance of this tradition which has survived intact from very ancient times. Secondly, it is the first time a complete text concerning Dzogchen has been made available to a general Western audience, and gains from the fact that it was actually written in modern times, almost certainly after 1930, written by Shard Satoshi Gelson, 1859 to 1935, a famous Bonpo master who gave teachings to students of other schools of Tibetan Buddhism, as well as to many students from the Bonpo community. It belongs within an unbroken lineage that remains active right up to the present day. Reappraisal of the Bonpo and their role in the development of Tibetan culture has been a feature of Western scholarship of the last 20 years, and we hope that this volume will help in this task. Toward this end, we have included with the text a short history of Yongdrung, Eternal Bon, from their own perspective, as well as biographies of Shard Zatashi Gelson and Lopan Tenzin Namdak, the Bonpo master responsible for this translation. It is important to note here that the Lopan recognizes three distinct types of Bon. The old Bon, which is entirely shamanistic, the new or reform bond, which arose in response to competition from other Buddhist schools, and the young drun or eternal bond, which is the tradition presented here. Young drun bond shares many similarities with the other traditions of Tibetan Buddhism, but traces its origin to a much earlier teacher than Shakyamuni Buddha, namely Ton, uh, Tonpa Buddha Shenrab, who taught in a country to the west of Tibet. The tradition then spread to the western regions of the Tibetan Plateau, most notably to the kingdom of Zhangzung in the Kailash region, and was already ancient when King Songtsen Gampo, Strong Bird Sons Gampo, uh, conquered the kingdom in the 7th century. When dealing with an ancient history that tells a story significantly different from the Buddhist histories of Tibet, one struggles to find pointers that can help either validate or at least locate some of the events within a Western conception of cultural progression. In particular, the idea that the culture of Yangdrung Bon originated in the region of Persia, and that many of the teachings originated from the west of the Tibetan Plateau instead of from the Indian subcontinent, and did so in a period that predated the time of the historical Buddha, seems almost incredible to those used to the received history of the conversion of Tibet in the time of the kings of the 7th century. Indeed, due to the periodic upheavals that have occurred in the region, and the fragility of the paper on which the texts were written, any attempt independently to assess the history is made immeasurably more difficult by the rarity of ancient texts that can be dated in their original form. Furthermore, in the case of the Bonpo, the early lineage was entirely transmitted orally, so it would appear that no direct records remain to give an insight into the early history. There are two expect uh, there are two exceptions to this conclusion, however. The first concerns important elements of ancient Tibetan culture, including both architecture as well as religious concepts, that have been noted by scholars as bearing comparison with ancient Persian culture. Since these elements date from the period when the Bon religion was preeminent in Tibet, they lend credence to the idea that Persian influences were important in ancient times. The line of evidence is more direct as regards the style and origin of the Bonpo Chorten monuments. Here, as in many other elements of Bonpo culture, it has been claimed that the Bonpo copied the Buddhist stupa style in an attempt to compete with Buddhist culture, even though there are important differences between them. 
Most notable are the Bonpo texts indicating temple enclosures within the structure of Chorten, which in consequence are often drawn from a box-like lower story beneath the recognizable stupa structure above. Another important difference is the use of a trident with a central flaming sword as the symbol on top of the structure instead of the sun and crescent moon used in the Buddhist style. Recently, two studies have been published concerning the images depicted in ancient rock carvings in the Karakoram and the Ladakh to the west of Tibet. These carvings are of particular interest as they can be dated by other means and so provide direct chronological evidence about the early period of Tibetan culture. It is therefore of some importance that one such carving from the Karakoram, dated as 1st century CE, clearly shows the characteristic style of a Bonpo stupa, with the opening in the base and the trident symbol, as well as the swastika symbol of Yangdrung Bon. Such evidence must make one wonder about the confident assertions that such a style was copied from the Indian Buddhist culture that did not arrive in Tibet until six centuries later. The Ladakhi carvings add to this picture, for although they were made by soldiers at the time of the expansion of Tibetan influence that coincided with the arrival of Buddhism from India, they all used the Banpa stupa style along with inscriptions in the archaic language of western Tibet, Zhangzung, that was supplanted by Tibetan. Again, the generally accepted idea that written language arrived in Tibet with Buddhism from India seems less credible in light of these findings. The translation of the text. The text presented here is the style of personal instruction from Shardza to his students. Such texts are called Mengagje uh, in the tradition of Dzogchen, and this text is a, con uh, is a condensate of a two-volume work by Shardza in the same style. The translation was carried out in the month of August 1991 by Lopon Tenzin Namdak in the course of teaching the text to a small group of Western students and his monastery in the Kathmandu Valley in Nepal. As the rain fell around us, Lopon spent two hours every morning translating and teaching from the text, which was typed on a portable word processor as he taught it. It was also tape recorded, which enabled us to check that the typed text was accurate and that no unwarranted omissions occurred from the Tibetan original. The typing and the correcting of the English was done by me, whilst the uh, checking of the typescript against both the tape and the original text was carried out by Monica Gentile, who is completing her thesis on aspects of Tibetan culture at the Sanskrit University at, uh, University at Benares, India. The final version was then read back to the Lopon, who checked it for a second time against the Tibetan original. Apart from the omission of some quotations in early sections, this process was applied to all sections of Shardza's original and the appendices that accompany it. Thanks here are also due to Che Go, who helped translate the biography of Shardza Tashi Gyaltsen, and Tadeusz Skorupski, who translated this uh, short story of Bonn that forms Appendix 2. The, sh the short history of Bon that uh, forms the appendix too. As well as being an acknowledged master of Dzogchen, Lopon Tenzin Namdak is a remarkable teacher with an encyclopedic knowledge of Bon Po culture and a lifetime's experience of teaching it to trainee monks, both in Tibet and India. Not only could he translate the text as he read it to us, but he was happy to answer any points of clarification or problems of interpretation as they arose during our sessions, and his answers form almost another Mengaji text alongside the original. These comments are to be found in the copious footnotes that accompany the text and should be read as a commentary to it at the same time. Reading it now in London, there are many other questions I would like to have asked him, but hope that many questions will be answered by presenting the text in this way. Following the suggestion of Per Kvarne, 
who very kindly offered to write an introduction to the text as well as check my English for inconsistencies. This text is better described as an exegetical commentary that, uh, than as a strict translation, as it is a commentary of what is, after all, a personal instruction by a great master of Dzogchen, this need not cause too much of a problem, and we hope it preserves some of the flavor of the text as it was taught. For those new to Dzogchen, however, a comprehensive resume of background reading is given by Professor Kvarne in the bibliographic essay that follows the text. The final point concerns the vexed question of how to present Tibetan terms in English, and we decided to use spellings that enable a rough enunciation of the Tibetan original, followed by the more precise uh, Wiley transliteration in uh, brackets afterward, so that the ease of reading the text would not be interrupted. As mentioned in the first line of this preface, this is indeed a rare event, and we hope that this wonderfully clear and concise text will be both comprehensible and useful to whoever reads it. It describes a tradition that is utterly extraordinary in the truest sense of that overused word, yet it is still active and available. May it serve to benefit beings. Richard Dixie, London, October 1991. Introduction It is still not widely known that Buddhism is not the only religion in Tibet. Buddhism, introduced in the 7th century CE under the patronage of powerful Tibetan kings, became the dominant religious faith in the 11th century and has remained so until today. Nevertheless, alongside Buddhism, a second religion has survived down through the centuries. This religion, for which there is no other term than its Tibetan designation of On, claims to be the very same religion that had long been established in Tibet when Buddhism entered the scene. Bon, so its inheritance claim, has a proud and ancient history, long antedating the origins of Buddhism in India. This claim has generally been dismissed by Western scholars who have, been, who have stressed the innumerable points of similarity, in fact often identity, between Bon and Buddhism, and thus concluded that Bon is essentially nothing more than a highly heterodox form of Buddhism. There is, however, a growing feeling among some scholars that the claim of Bon to be a separate religious tradition with an identity of its own has to be taken seriously. Nor should it be forgotten that Tibetan Buddhists, too, have on the whole regarded Bon as an entirely distinct non-Buddhist religion. This does not mean that the Bon Po version of history necessarily has to be accepted at face value, at least as far as the period preceding the 7th century is concerned. It does mean, however, that if, instead of focusing on monastic life and metaphysical doctrine, where the merging with Buddhism often appears to be complete, one looks at the sources of religious authority and legitimation, the distinctiveness of Bon, as understood by most Tibetans, becomes immediately apparent. The Bon Pos, as opposed to Buddhists, do not derive religious legitimation from the Buddha Shakyamuni, but from an enlightened being, Tonpa Shenrab, um, the teacher Shenrab. Long before Shakyamuni, Tonpa Shenrab lived as a prince and later as a king of Olmo Lungring, a land situated, so the Bon Pos assert, to the west of Tibet. Olmo Lungring is often identified with Tazig, generally held by Tibetans to be the Iranian or Persian world. Furthermore, the doctrine which Ton Pashenrab preached, i.e. Bon, is believed to have come to Tibet not from India as Buddhism did, but rather from a land the historical existence of which, though little else, is fully attested, via V. Zangzong located in what today is, in a broad sense, western and northern Tibet. The Bon religion is alive and indeed to some extent even flourishing today, not only in Tibet itself, where especially in the east, Kham, and northeast, Amdo, entire districts still firmly adhere to Bon, but also in Nepal, Dalpo, and Lupra, in, in the Tibetan exile communities in India. Both in Tibet and in exile, there are several erudite and spiritually highly accomplished Bonpo Lamas, one of the most venerated of whom is Lopon. 
a head teacher, Tenzin Namdak, for an increasing number of Tibetan and Western disciples and friends, his learning and warm, compassionate presence have been a profoundly moving experience. The present text should be seen as the fruit of an encounter between a highly qualified Tibetan Bonpo Lama, willing and indeed eager to share his vast store of knowledge, and a Western pupil equally eager to learn and communicate to others what has been learnt. As a document resulting from such an intention, the text will repay study. It gives an indication, a kind of rough hint, of the spiritual treasures to be found in the Bon tradition. At the same time, it is essential to realize that this text is not, it is not a real translation. The careful work of interpretation and collation, based on a close and competent study of a large number of texts in the original Tibetan, remains to be done. And it is this alone which may, at some future time, make accurate and adequate translations possible. The reader is well advised to have no illusions about this. Even less should the text be taken to be a do-it-yourself manual for those who aspire actually to practice the spiritual discipline, to attain the great perfection described therein. For such practice, the personal ra uh, regular guidance of a qualified, experienced Lama is absolutely indispensable. Uh, those wishing to experiment on their own may be assured that whatever mental experiences uh, they may have will be either delusive or, the danger is a real one, destructive. The great perfection, Tsogpa Chenpo Tsogchen, is regarded by Bonpos as the highest, the ultimate religious practice. It has been preserved in several distinct traditions. Also, the Nyingmapa school of Buddhism has a Dzogchen tradition, which it claims goes back to the great Siddha Padmasambhava, 8th century CE, and his disciples. A comparative study of the Bonpo and the Nyingmapa varieties of Dzogchen remains to be undertaken. Nevertheless, in recent years, a fairly lively interest in Dzogchen has been evident both among a number of scholars and among the more numerous Western adepts. The bibliographic essay appended to the text is not complete, but should be useful to those who want to find further information and perhaps return to the present text with a better understanding of its subject matter. Per Kavarne, University of Oslo. Biography of Shardzatashi Gyaltsen. In general, there are three sections to a master's biography, the external, which is also the general biography, the internal, and the esoteric biography. Here on the general biography is described, but in it there are some parts which concern the specific internal and esoteric aspects as well. There are eight subdivisions of the external biography. 1. His birth. 2. How he began learning the religious path. 3. How he began thinking and practicing according to the path of Yang Drung Bon. 4. How he received teachings, initiations, and vows. 5. How he practiced in solitude. 6. How he worked for the doctrines of Tonpa Shenrab and for the benefit of all beings. 7. The teachings and works he left behind and eight, how he manifested his great knowledge as a rainbow body. His birth. When Shardzatashi Gyaltsen was born, there were many auspicious signs. In the sky there were many rainbows and there was a shower of flowers. The country in which he was born is in the Kham region of East Tibet. It is a place in between two rivers, the Jachu and the Adgulchu, uh, uh, and is called Dagang, or the Range of Dagang. This is a place where many saints have previously been born, or have stayed and visited. It is known in short as Zakong. The name of the village in which Shardza was born is, da, uh, is Dabrda in the foothills of that place. His father belonged to the clan of Hor and was called Tashi uh, Ga, and his mother was called Balig. He was born on the 
eighth day of the third month of the Earth Sheep Year, 1859. From his childhood, he did not give his parents much trouble and was easy to raise. Even from his infancy, he always had good manners and behaved with calm and composure. He also showed the auspicious signs of teaching other children, building stupas and chanting, and in this way pretended to be the teacher. Sometimes he also saw forms of divinities in space. When he was nine years old, a great siddha called Tenzin Wangyal, whose secret name was Drenpadodul, told his parents, your son must become a monk. But the parents refused because Shardza was their only son. Soon after, Shardza developed some mental sickness and for many days neither ate nor slept. So the parents took him to Tenzin Wangyal, who again said, this child is connected to the religious way of life. You should send him on the religious path, otherwise he will not be useful of uh, he will not be useful for you. This time the parents understood and decided to let the child become a monk. When they returned home, the child's mental sickness gradually lifted, and he was finally released from it. How he began learning the religious path. Tenzin Wangyal recognized that the boy had a very long-lasting connection with him over many past lives, so he was very kind to this boy, this boy from the beginning, and the boy was always very devoted to him. When the child was born, he had blessed him with long life. After the boy became older, he took the refuge vow from Tenzin Wangyal, who prayed that the boy would become beneficial to all sentient beings. Thus he gave the boy the name Tashi Gyaltsen, he also made a special prayer to the Red Sipa Gyalmo to bless the boy. When the boy was twelve, he went to his uncle, Young Drung Gyaltsen, to learn how to read and write. Soon after, the boy received many initiations, teachings, and transmissions from the special master, Tenzin Wangyal. Tenzin Wangyal knew that the boy would be important for Ton Pashenrab's teachings and for the benefit of all sentient beings, so he advised the boy to take the Vinaya vows, the Tantric vows, and the Tsogchen vows. He also told the boy to practice and meditate diligently, learning Sutra, Tantra, and Tsogchen. One day Tenzin Wang yelled, put a huge volume of books on the boy's head and prayed for a long time and said, You will be the owner of this doctrine. From that moment Shardza had a great change of feeling and this was the beginning of his receiving auspicious signs. This was the beginning of the mental initiation and blessing that Shardza was to receive from Tenzin Wangyal. The boy now became very sharp and intelligent, had great devotion, stopped all desires for the worldly life, and naturally increased his compassion and devotion to both the doctrines and his masters, particularly to Tenzin Wangyal, who transformed his mental blessing to him. One springtime there was a drought, and the local people asked Tenzin Wangyal to call for rain. Tenzin Wangyal took the boy with him as assistant. He gave the boy a sword and asked him to push down the wind. Shardza held on to the sword, and after some time the master returned suddenly, took the sword forcefully away from the boy, and showed the face of anger. He used the sword to hit the boy, who fell unconscious. After a while the boy woke up, and at that moment he received the heart transmission from his master, and realized the natural state clearly, in the same level as his master. From then on, whatever he studied, it was as easy for him as if he had known it before, and he meditated with the recognition of this natural state day and night. He was never again in any doubt, and was never in fear of not having the knowledge of the natural state. He also started learning grammar and poetry. From then on, he began keeping notes for his books called The Five Treasures, a collection of thirteen volumes of his writings. Besides, his meditation was very stable and developed without his having to practice as hard as other people. He also had special knowledge of the nine ways of bond, yet he behaved in the same way as an ordinary young boy. How he received teachings, initiations, and vows. When he was young, he kept the vow of refuge and other simple vows very strictly. Everyone praised his manner of keeping the vows. 
When he was older, the abbot of Yang Drung Ling, whose name was Kelzang Nima Togi Galtsen, came to come. He was invited to Chachekin Gonpa, the boy's monastery. There many people took their vows from this abbot, and each received a name at the same time. When it came to Shardza, he received the name Tenpa Drudan from the abbot who repeated the name three times. All those who were taking the vows burst out laughing loudly. The abbot said that it was a very auspicious sign and that the boy would become a great man. The reincarnation of Tajig, whose name is Shengyel Tenzin, came to the Dzakog country upon the invitation of Shards's monastery. He was the holder of the Vinaya vows of the Men Menri lineage. In front of the abbot, the Lopan, or teacher, a witness, and an interpreter, all four of whom were high monks, Shardza took the highest and final Vinaya vows. He kept his original name, Ten Padrudang, and initially received the name Drime Nyingpo. From that time onward, he never took any alcohol, never ate meat, nor wore the skin of animals, and he conducted himself completely according to the Vinaya rules. Altogether, he observed 230 vows. The second vow is the vow of Bodhicitta, and he took from Samtin Yeshe. At the same time, he received the name Gyaltse Zenpin Norbu. He practiced the two kinds of Bodhicitta, one that is according to the absolute truth and the other according to the relative truth. When he took the vows, he offered hundreds and thousands of butter lamps, flowers, incense, and torma, ritual cakes. From then on, he always kept the vows precisely and paid attention to all details. In addition, different texts mention different vows as part of the bodhicitta vow. Some mention 20 vows, and some mention an extended form of 360 vows. Some mention a medium form of 108 vows, and some 28 vows. These vows can be described as the four kinds of bodhicitta vows, all of which Shardza practiced. In addition, he also practiced the Ten Perfections. The Tantric Vows Shardza took the Tantric Vows from his root master, Tenzin Wangyal. He took the initiation of the Yidim called the Walsin Yangpa. At the time of the initiation, he was introduced to the nature of mind, the four initiations of the Yidim, and the initiation of Dzogchen called Gyaltab Chilug from another master called Rigzin Tsewang Dragpa, who was also known as Dechen Lingpa, he received the initiation of the peaceful and the wrathful form of this same Yidim, Walsin Yangpa. Also, he received the Dzogchen initiation of Rigpai Tselwang, as well as the preliminary and essential te uh, teachings of Atri, besides many other tantric initiations. In the Chantric vow, there are five root vows and 25 branch vows for the Kyarim, and five root vows and 100 branch vows for the Dzogrim. In Dzogchen, there are 30 vows. Shardza kept all these vows carefully and clearly. In the Banpo tradition, all the vows mentioned above are those that can be taken by a person who can take all three types of vows, which he did. Although Shardza had 24 teachers from whom he learned different subjects, usually in those days people were satisfied after learning from one or two masters. But Shardza was special. He continued to seek and learn all the time. To the following masters he offered all his wealth, and from, uh, and from them he received all the teachings of different subjects, initiations, and transmissions. 1. Jasper Tsan Zin Bangro, Zechen Lingpa, Dujo Lingpa, Sam Ten Yeshe, Shengyel Tenzin, Tsewang Gyurme, Rinchen Namgyel, Kelzen Nima, Meten Yima Gyaltsen, Ten Paten Yima Bumsel, Eleven Yungdrung Wangyel, 12. Sultrim Namdak, 13. Sonam Gyaltsen, 14. Sultrim Pelzang, 15. Sonam Pelzang, 
16 Nima Ozer, 17 Togden Gede, 18 Yeshe Tenzin, 19 Lama Tengyal, 20 Yeshin Wangyal, 21 Sangneng Lingpa, 22 Chime Sungpu, 23 Nima Zangpo, 24 Dawa Dragpa. How he practiced in solitude. When Shardza was about 34 years old, one day he felt great disgust for living in this worldly life, so he decided to go stay in solitude completely. The place he went to stay was Yungdrung Lunpo, which bordered Shardza, his country. When he went there, many auspicious signs appeared, so he decided that it was a suitable place. There he built a small hut, just big enough for him to sit inside. At this place he completely stopped all external and bodily activities and connections, and internally his mind stopped thinking of plans and desires, including relatives, friends, and wealth. Living in solitude he only had simple food and one set of clothes. In this way he practiced with a rested body, speech, and mind. He started, as was done normally, by doing the preliminary practice of the teaching. He also did the refuge, bodhicitta, and the esoteric practices. At that time, people generally learned and practiced the Bonpo teaching only for food and wealth, those people considering it sufficient just to do some rituals and prayers to please those who demanded it. However, Shardza saw all the essential points of the Bonpo teachings and practiced accordingly, without paying any attention to such worldly thoughts. In his own country, the tradition of the teaching was mixed up with the newborn. He was able to see clearly the historical and pure part of the old Bon teachings and completely left out the new Bon teaching, keeping strictly to the old Yungdrung tradition. In Bonpo, there are five high clans or families of people, which are the Bru, the Zhu, the Spa, the Rume, and the Shen clans. Each one has its own lineage, tradition, and strict rules, even though they are all Bonpos. He respected all these traditions, but he followed the Drew tradition because this is the lineage holder of Menri. From the beginning, he practiced the relative bodhicitta and the absolute bodhicitta. He practiced with great hardship and solitude. He also practiced the Kirim and Zogrim of various Yidams in the Tantric teachings. He divided the 24 hours of a day into four sessions and practiced most of the Yidams, particularly peaceful Kunzang, uh, Drenpanamka, and Sewang, or Black Kila. He practiced everything, including Tumo, Zogrim, and Mantra. Even though he mainly practiced the recitation of Mantra, he especially did the practice of Tregcho and Togel all the time. How he worked for the doctrines of Tonpa Shenrab and for the benefit of all beings. He worked for the preliminary teachings and the history of Sutra, Tantra, and Dzogchen. Hence, he compiled them into two volumes, his commentaries on the Nine Ways of Bon and on Trekcho and Togil of Dzogchen, in particular, were compiled into two volumes. He held the lineage of Zhangzong Nyenyu teachings. He also wrote many ritual texts for prayers and Gana Puja, as well as Chod teachings, Sutra, and Tantra teachings, with various sub Objects in the sutra and their commentaries. All his work is like a lamp for the old Bon tradition. Later in our time, when people eagerly want to know something about Bon, his works are like a key to the whole tradition. He had many disciples following his teaching. Among them, the best disciple was called Turchin Sangyang Lingpa. His successor was his nephew, Lodro Gyatso. Besides these disciples, he also had many others to whom he gave special transmissions. He was always teaching and giving transmissions. He never showed tiredness when people went to him for teachings. Aside from that, he still strictly kept his own sessions of practice. The teachings and works he left behind. He helped his monastery, Tsateng Chingongpa, to rebuild. For the exterior, he reconstructed the temple, and for the interior, he restored the images. Three images are two stories high, about 18 feet tall. There are many other smaller ones which are one story, about 9 feet tall. 
On the outside of these images we made many decorations of precious things, and inside he did relics and books of important teachings and mantras. Below his hut for solitary retreat, one of his students, Sangyang Limpa, proposed to him that he build a meditation center. The place where the center was built was called Gethang. There he built a temple with images inside. Gradually people offered him properties, and he used these places to build many temples. Inside these temples he built several hundred images of various sizes. He also carved many blocks for printing books. Particularly, he collected works which amount to 13 volumes. Altogether, 330 volumes of books were carved in blocks. Five huge prayer wheels and several large stupas were also made. All of these things, together with the properties offered to him, were in turn offered to his first uh, to his master from time to time. He also made offerings to all the temples and monasteries in his country, regardless of whether they were Buddhist or Bonpo. Whenever there were practitioners who were in need, he also helped them with their living. He always offered flowers, incense, butter lamps, water, and mandala on a regular basis. Every tenth day of the month he made offerings of Ganapuja. Even though he was teaching a lot, he remained in his solitary retreat hut. Gradually, however, his students began to teach extensively in many teaching centers in the east of Tibet. Later he made his nephew the successor to the meditation center in Gethang, and his nephew took over the teaching responsibility when Shardza was getting old. In all his teaching centers the Vinaya vow was strictly observed, while the meditation practice was Dzogchen. How he manifested his great knowledge as a rainbow body. When he was seventy-five, in the Waterbird year, Shardza changed his manner of teaching. In addition to the more serious topics, he gave more general kinds of teaching to his students, giving them advice. Usually he only had one meal a day, but then he began to accept all offerings. Regardlessly he, uh, regardlessly, he also liked to play with children more and began behaving very freely without any consideration of how his worldly manner should be. Some of the students began to see him manifesting as the form of various divinities. Some of his helpers also saw him walking away with his feet above the ground. Some saw him leave his bowl floating in mid-air. At night they could not see his body throw any shadow in the light of the lamps. He was noticed very clearly. He also said to his disciples, I, the old man Shardzapa, don't know when I am to pass away. I have been teaching specifically for the past eight years, and I have taught many important things, and I hope that you are not going to waste them. I advise you not to waste any of these teachings you have received but continue to practice until you are stable in your natural state. I think you are all very lucky because it is very rare to receive these teachings. Since you have received them, you must try to realize yourself. They are very precious. Can you understand? When he was 76, in the wood dog year, one of his disciples, Kelzang Yundrung, was pray praying and practicing in order to bless some, medi uh, some medicine. Shardza took this disciple to finish his prayers before the fourth month, because after that they would not meet again. Then on the second day of the fourth month, Sharza was presented with the blessed medicine with the prayer complete. He said, Now I have to go to the empty places. So he went to the place called Rabzi Teng to stay. He put up a small tent there. Several of his students followed him and he told them, The base of all knowledge is faith, devotion, and vow, so you must realize this and carefully practice. In addition, he also gave them much advice. Very often his gazes were straight into space. On the thirteenth day of the fourth month, he made a Ganapuja offering of Tsewang Bo Yulma, and he sang many teachings in the form of songs. He then ordered his disciples to sew the tent completely closed and not to open it for many days. Then he went into the tent and said good luck to his students as well as prayers. Then he sat inside in the posture with five characteristics. On the next day his students saw many rainbows above his tent. Some were big, some were small, some were round, others were straight, horizontal, or vertical, all with many colors. Particularly at night, white lights, like long white scarves, shone forth brilliantly, which everyone saw. On the fourth day, there was an earthquake, and there were loud and strange sounds. 
Also showers of flowers rained down. Between the stitches of the tent many lights with different colors, some with five colors, some with only a single color, came out like steam. His student called Sultrim Wang Cheng said, If we leave the body for much longer, everything will disappear and there will be nothing left from the corpse. We should have something as relics for our devotion. So he opened the tent and prostrated. The body of Shardza was completely wrapped up with light, and the size had shrunk to that of a one-year-old boy. It was suspended above the mattress at a height equal to the distance between the outstretched fingertip and the elbow of an arm. He went into the tent and saw the fingernails had come out of the fingers and were scattered on the mattress. When he touched the body, the heart was still warm. He wrapped up the body with a cloth and kept it for forty-nine days. He then did a puja of the one thousand names of the Buddhas, as well as many Gana puja and other offerings. After, when visitors saw the body and touched it, everyone had many special feelings rising in themselves. All the people saw lights, rainbows, and rains of flowers every day. All the local people visited the body, and strong devotion arose in all of them, and they had great belief in him. Some of the non-believers were saying that the Lama has uh, not so special when he was alive, but is more special dead, so he is better dead than alive. His successor, Lodro Gyatso, and his younger brother, Tsultrim Tenzing, saw to it that all his properties were given as offerings and donations to all monasteries, both Buddhist and Bonpo, particularly to his own monastery, Tsachengchen Gonpa. They also asked the monasteries to do prayers for many weeks and gave them properties so that every year they would recite prayers on the anniversary of the manifestation of his rainbow body, the thirteenth day of the fourth month. They also made a large memorial stupa with gilded copper, and his body was put inside in the niche in the ball of the stupa. Even much later, people still could see the reflection of lights and rainbows and sparks coming from it. Extracted and translated by Lopontenzing Namdak from the biographical account by Solsa Kelzang Tenpai Yeltsin, 1897 to 1959. Introduction. In the text there are three subdivisions according to whether the student is clever, medium, or not bright. By following these practices the first will achieve Buddhahood in one lifetime, the second in the intermediate state, and the third after several lives of using the Dzogchen methods. These subdivisions occur in every section of the text and do not refer to the four major books into which it has been divided. Book 1. Preliminary Practices, Tibetan Text, 3a, line 2. First, there is a preliminary practice which is described in two sections. The purpose of the first practice is to distinguish between samsara and nirvana. The purpose of the second is to stop desire for body, speech, and mind. The first preliminary practice cycle, to distinguish samsara from nirvana. The first practice is further subdivided into external and internal practices. External practice. Go to a quiet place without any people and stay there. First make offerings to the mountain gods or whoever is powerful and spiritual in the area so that they are not disturbed. Tell them where you are practicing so that you do not disturb them. Then thinking that you must stop desire for samsara, ask what is the purpose of so much attachment. You need to ask why you have this desire. Imagine that you are naked and born in hell, screaming and suffering as if you are actually there. Then imagine that you are born in the realm of the hungry ghosts, the pretas, with endless hunger and want. Imagine you are born in the animal realm, doing as animals do. Then think that you are born as a human with servants. Imagine that life then as a titan, Ashura, fighting with another. What is the purpose of that? Finally, imagine that you are born as a god, Deva, and spending life in leisure without thinking of the next life. What is the purpose of this? Imagine that you are circulating from one realm to the next. Do whatever comes to your mind in vision or imagination. Then imagine what it is like to be a yidyam, a tutelary deity, or that you are in Shambhala and are teaching the bodhisattvas, or in the tantric realms with the siddhas as disciples, 
or in Sukhavati or Olmo Longdring teaching Dzogchen Po. Pretend that you are actually doing this. Finally dissolve all visions into the natural state. What is left? Then dissolve even your thought itself into the natural state so there is nothing left. Then you will realize that everything is made by your thought. Everything comes from there. You have to realize how things are created. You must practice this seriously for at best three months or at least one month. Lopan comments that it is necessary to practice in this way as a preliminary to the main practice, so the mention of time requirements is quite serious and deliberate. Think that it is very important to make such a period of preparation, and not just for a little while. Therefore, prepare as much as you can. Apart from eating and sleeping, this practice should be carried on for the entire day. If you go to an empty valley or cave, what else is there to do? This is serious practice. Not not like the common gondro. This is for the person who is absolutely fed up with the worldly life. Otherwise, it is difficult to give up all the other things. Regarding this, we asked Lopan whether it was absolutely necessary to go to a solitary place for his practice, and he said that it was not. If we can't, we should at least keep to regular sessions and do it seriously in order to have results. He said that in the Western lifestyle, we have many free periods in which we can practice, so sometimes it may be even better uh, than being a monk, because a monk has so many different duties and rituals to perform. Lopan further comments that with regard to the content, the six realms of visualization is one means, but there is also the realization of samsara as such. This is done exclusively. If you try to practice alongside all the worldly activities, then it is very difficult not to be distracted. And if you don't do the nandro seriously, then the other practices will only look like leisure. Lopan comments that although humans look at water and sea water, water beings of other realms, look at the same thing and perceive it differently. When animals see it, they only see it as something to drink, but not water. The hell beings see it as fire, as ice. The pretas as some sort of dirty thing. What we see is always conditioned by our previous actions. We only see our own karma that we can check from the clear example that if two or three people go together to see something, they all see and feel different things. This gives an idea. The result is seeing that everything is created by your thought. Once you finally realize that you can check back to find its origin, all things are created by your thought and mind, and if you look back to the source of your thought and mind, you find that it disappears. It dissolves and goes back to its nature. That is the limit. Every individual thing is dependent on the mind. All worldly life, all the beings in the six realms are in the same situation. The purpose of this practice is to stop all desire for the worldly life, to see that it is all created by our mind. The world is like a common mind. All human beings share the same vision and the, and the same karma. Likewise, for the beings in the other realms, they all share a karmic vision of the world. Take the individual mind, for example. One person might think that he is good, although others think he is bad. Internal practice. The second part of the first preliminary practice is to stop desire through internal visualization and recitation. It should be done for at least seven weeks. The actual practice is not described in this text. Briefly, there is a mantra in sending lights to the six realms to purify all defilements. It is more connected to the tantric system. The second preliminary practice cycle, to stop desire for body, speech, and mind. The practice for the body. Here one practices with the body. One stands up and places the soles of the feet together with the knees out and the hands joined above the head. The neck is bent to the chest. That is the body posture. One visualizes oneself as a three-pointed dorje, flaming and blue. Commentary. A, man, a mother may see a man as her son, but his wife sees him as a husband. All this is created by individual minds. People see others uh, through their 
preconceptions. Everything is created. This realization makes it possible for us to develop in positive or negative ways, but we are covered with our ignorance, for always we are grasping. If, every, if things exist as our grasping mind sees them, as objects that are real and fixed, then nothing can change in this world, but nothing is fixed. That is how we are deluded. It is to break this deluded perception that is the purpose of this practice. Lopan comments that Shardza composed his own collections uh, here, which are described in the main text. They are taken from the Zhangzhang Yangzhu, uh, which has been published in Delhi. These internal practices are best done alongside the external practice in the same session. Uh, Lopan comments that the three types of practice are best carried out in the same session, one type after another. Inhale the breath and hold it. Hold that posture until you cannot hold it any longer. At that point, fall down backwards, exhaling with ha strongly. Do this many times. This practice serves three purposes. First, it purifies the body. Second, the demons see the flaming Vajra and leave you alone. And third, it stops desire for the body. The practice for the speech. The second type of practice is for the speech. There are four subdivisions. Gyejapa, sealed. Tseljongpa, practice. Nyenselpa, the training. And Lamduzung, to put in the way. The seal, Gyadapa, th there are three subdivisions. A, external Gyadapa, whom is a seal for the impure mind, whom is used since it symbolizes the Buddha mind. The practice is to sit cross-legged and gaze into space. Visualize your mind at the heart as a blue whom, then sound hum slowly many times. At the same time, visualize the blue hum emitting rays of little hums, which come out through the right nostril, filling up the universe with hum. Whatever the hum touches turns into another blue hum. Everything both internally and externally, your mind is completely absorbed into hum. Nothing else is happening. Always sound the hum soft and long. B. Internal Gidapa. Now sound hum in a fast rhythm and imagine that all the hums dissolve into uh, dissolve one into another and come back to the heart through the left nostril. Then they come to the inside of the body. All the flesh and blood turns into hum so that the body is filled with hum. Hold this vision for a long time. The three points of the dorje are made by the elbows and the hands. C. The purpose, Zogspa, of Gildapa. Thus you realize that no object, not even your body, is self-sustaining. Nothing, not even your body, has independent material existence. Everything can be easily changed. When you have practiced long enough signs, uh, when you practice long enough signs come, such as an unexpected vision of whom externally, or that you suddenly feel that your body is filled with whom, that is a sign that you have practiced Gyadapa enough. 2. The practice of visions as reflections, Tshel Jungpa. Whatever vision comes to mind is reflection, so this practice is to destroy whatever comes and dissolve it into mind. The practice is similar to before. Sitting with the five-point body posture, visualize a dark blue hum inside the heart. Now you should sound the hum very strongly, very sharply, and visualize the hum as a very strong fire with swords, throwing off sparks like lightning. This hum comes out through the right nostril in the form of many hums, and whatever they touch they destroy. Finally they go through everything and destroy in all directions. Everything is destroyed by this strong hum. Then again it comes back through the left nostril and destroys all the material of your body. It also helps to send away all sickness and disturbance. It can even help the formation of the jaus, the body of light, by stopping all desire for the body. The signs that this has been practiced enough are to have the sudden vision that the universe is just an illusion and that your body is thin like a net, unsubstantial, that is the sign. The training, Nian Selpa, the purpose here is to tame your mind and bring it under control. You practice by placing a stick in front of you and sounding hum continuously like a beat. 
Then many homes come out from the heart like beads and leave the body through the nostrils and go to the base of the stick. Commentary. This is to sit with the legs crossed, back straight, neck slightly bent, eyes looking to the chest and mouth slightly open. They climb the stick like ants, wrapping around it. When the first one comes to the top of the stick, it stops, facing you. The rest are wrapped around in a spiral. When thoughts disturb you, all the hums come back to the first home at the heart. You have to spend some time doing this, and it brings the th thoughts under control so you can meditate for as long as you want to. 4. To put in the way, Lam Du Zun. This means to put the body, speech, and mind into the right way, to put them into the natural clear light. The practice is to think of a blue hum the size of the distance from your elbow to your fingertips. This represents your body, speech, and mind, everything. When you sound hum, it moves to the right and left, and then it moves off, traveling over the countryside, until finally it goes to countries that you have never been. All the while say hum whom continuously, then stop it by saying fat, strongly and suddenly. The vision disappears and you rest as you are. You remain in your nature. This whom can go to the heavens or to Shambhala. Suddenly you stop it by sounding fat. By sounding fat, you will stop thoughts and remain in the natural state. By carrying out this practice, you will begin to have experiences, yams of bliss, emptiness and clarity. The sign that you have carried out this practice enough is that you will be able to remain in the natural state without any doubt or effort. The practice of the mind, Shem Yongpa. These are direct methods of introduction to the natural state. The methods described above are all material ways to bring you to the natural state. Below are given nine methods to bring you directly to this state. Commentary. Lopan comments that this part of the preliminary practice is done in sessions, first as a section for body, then for speech, and finally one for the mind, all in one section. The first three methods come down under the title, Where Does It Come From, Where Does It Stay, and Where Does It Go? Holding the five-point body posture, look back to the origin of thought and inquire whether the natural state is material, visible, or invisible. You have to check back. You cannot find where this object is or who is searching for it. When you try, you lose everything. Like the sky that is the empty mind, you start to realize the empty mind. Checking the normal worldly vision. When you realize this point, you can try to destroy it, but you will find nothing. Whatever you do, it is not possible to do anything with this empty nature. Even when all thoughts are stopped, there is still a very bright and clear presence that is empty. That is called clear, natural mind. All things are independent and self-sustaining. Then you could find out by checking all your visions as described above to discover their nature. But when you practice in this method, although vision comes as normal, your understanding is different. Commentary As before, this is an intense process, sometimes to go out, but most of the time, uh, but most of the time practice. Lopan comments that we uh, see all things as independent objects. We cannot see that all are reflections of the natural state. What we are seeing are all delusions that do not in fact exist independently. They are like the visions that come in dreams. However, if these visions were all independent and self-sustaining, we would be able to determine this through a process of inquiry. Take this table for example. If we ask whether the table can be found in the top, the sides, the legs, or the bottom, we cannot find it. If something was independent and self-sustaining, i.e. had inherent existence, it would remain after such inquiry. This is a very widely used method of analysis in Buddhism. See Jeffrey Hopkins' Meditation and Emptiness, London Wisdom Books, 1983. Checking the object in this way is a simple procedure and not so difficult. The problem is in the reconstruction of perception. You see that all visions are illusion. You have realized the nature of non-stop illusion. Looking to where the reflections come, the fifth method, the visions come to mind. But where do they appear and who understands them? 
who taste sadness and happiness, if you look back to the mind's situation, you will see that everything is made by the mind. But if you look to the mind, you will see that the mind too seems to have no independent existence. However, if the mind is not there, then who called the names and made the causes of existence? Therefore the mind must exist, and everything else exists in dependence on mind. Nothing exists independently of mind. Commentary Lopon comments that philosophy can be useful to introduce the Dzogchen view. Although you cannot explain the nature of mind, you can point to the place where it can be found, like a child pointing to the moon. Usually, Dogchenpas do not discuss the view from a logical or analytical standpoint because they are not trained to do so. This is not the case in the Bon tradition, however, where a school of philosophy unique to Dzogchen has developed. In any case, the least a Dzogchenpa can do is explain what he or she is doing and thinking. Lopan comments this use of minds uh, is not in the sense of consciousness, it is the mind as the nature of mind. It is not like the Chittamatra mind only view. This reference to Chittamatra concerns the store consciousness or Khuji. In this uh, view, it is where all the karmic traces are kept, and if you purify it, you achieve Buddhahood. Although this term is used in Dzogchen, uh, there it means the natural state, the base, and there is no concept of purification. The base is primordially pure, kadag, pure from the beginning, so the practice is not purification but recognition of that state. Take the external world for example. In Chitamatra it is explained like the two halves of a hard-boiled egg that is cut down the middle so that the object uh, side and the subject side of an individual existence match. Nothing be exists beyond the natural state. Earth is not independent of the natural state. Stone is not independent of the natural state. Visions are not independent visions. Everything is a vision of the natural state. The natural state is like a single point. The natural state is like where birds fly. Behind there is no trace. If you understand this point, you will realize that the natural state is the creator of all things, the king of creators commentary. But Tsongchen says that everything is encompassed by the natural state, which has the power to make and take reflections. What is reflected in the mind does not independently exist. Both internal and external are spontaneous reflections in the natural state. To do this is a natural quality of the primordial state, uh, but does not mean that these reflections are solid, independent, and inherently existent. They arise from the natural state and go back to it. It is our ignorance that grasps them as independent. So Chittamatra philosophy is often confused with Dzogchen. In Chittamatra it is said that both the objective and the subjective worlds arise from karmic causes. In Dzogchen, however, the world spontaneously exists. It is conditioned by karma, but its source is the natural state. Mandyamika philosophy does not accept the concept of Kunji at all. However, it only accepts the six types of consciousness, senses, and mind rather than the eight of Chittamatra and Dzogchen. In those systems, after the six senses, the seventh is Nonye, emotions, and the eighth is Kunji. An analogy, anal, um, an analogy is sometimes used. The mind is the husband, and Nyonyi is the wife. Kunji is the storehouse, and the senses collect the goods that come into the storehouse from the outside. So Dzogchen holds many aspects in common with Chittamatra, and the object side and the subject side are inseparable in both systems. Crucially, however, in Dzogchen the natural state is pure from the beginning and is always present. There is nothing to purify and nothing to reach.